I've been sitting with my grief about what is happening in Israel and in the Palestinian territories. Uh, maybe for over 20 years. And especially in the events of this past week, uh, the murder of six hostages, including uh, the Ben Bait, the, the homeboy of Berkeley, Herschel Ben Peril Khana, the Yonatan Shimshon, who davened in my synagogue, who walked my streets. Um, it's really hard to think about psychedelics, mysticism, Judaism, um, without just feeling like, what is this all for? Is this a luxury? Is this medicine? But uh, a friend of mine, speaking right after October 7th, maybe two days later, when I was walking around in an event in San Francisco, I mean two days later, in San Francisco with a lot of other social entrepreneurs and looking the way that I do. Big black kippa, long white beard, white shirt, black coat, jeans, Nike Air Force Ones. You know, I'm, I'm Jewish, but I'm cool. And the, as we say in my household, the dirty eyeballs. You know, this friend of mine said, I was, as I was reflecting, I was ready to leave the event, and I, I ultimately did. I felt so uncomfortable. Um, he adjured me to, as he said, live in your commitment and not only in your concern. Live in my commitment and not only in my concern. My commitment is to the Jewish people. My commitment is to the Holy One. My commitment is to every single human being in human life that is created in the divine image. I, I have no choice. These are all my siblings. And the ones who are innocent, the ones who are behaving poorly, and the ones who are uh, beyond poor, detestable. So I'm living in my commitment, and I'm reflecting on, on this past year. Taf Shin Pei Dalid. Even before October 7th, I was thinking 5784, Tashin Pei Dalid. What is the acronym that will spell out the rest of this year? And uh, painfully prescient from my teacher, Rabbi uh, Mimi Feigelson. She said that Tashin Pei Dalid spells Tehei. Shnat Pidyon Dalim. May this year be the year of redemption for the downtrodden. We didn't know at the time uh, just how just how downtrodden we would be and just how long the Pidyon, the redemption, would take if it would ever come at all. 
So in honor of this coming year and living in my commitment and not only in my concern, my wish is for Tafshin Pei He to be Tehe Shnat Po. May this year be the year of Pei He Po, of right here, of full presence, with my family, with my body, with my spirit with our community, with what I am trying to bring to Heishnat Po. But it can also be to Heishnat Pe. May this year be the year of Pe, the mouth. I have an obligation to speak and speak up and speak out and speak into myself. And part of that is to be also sitting in the seat of teaching Torah, which turns out as a social entrepreneur and founder and CEO of a nonprofit, I don't get to do that often, as often as I would like. And so I thought that in the loving memory of Herschel ben Peril Chana v. Yonatan Shimshon. Hirsch, Poland, Goldberg, blessed memory, all those who have perished in this terrible, terrible tragedy. To learn some psychedelic Torah, I have learned over the past year and past couple years just a few texts that I think have been very supportive for me and for other people who are yearning to create their own Jewish and psychedelic practice and to bridge these two parts of themselves in some way. So many people who have been touched or inspired or moved or catalyzed by their psychedelic experiences here, abroad, in clinics, trials, underground work. What I hear so often is just that they don't know the way back. They don't know the way back to the garden. They've never been. How do I go back to a place that I've never been? Lauren Taus calls this the pathless path. There is no way back. There is only Po. There's only right here. We start where we are. And so we find what we are committed to. And we find those voices in our tradition that speak to what we are committed to. We also find those voices in our tradition that are not as committed to what we are committed to. And that is the great Jewish tension. That we're not just trying to find the proof texts for our lifestyles and commitments and choices. But the here and there. As Franz Rosenzweig says in the Star of Redemption that, or no, rather, sorry, in the New Thinking, that we are trying to make the God of over there closer and the God of closer farther away. And that feels like such a beautiful and powerful psychedelic idea that we're working with these paradoxes. We live in them all the time. But opening up to actually connecting them and seeing how they feed and dance with each other. So we're starting here. We're starting with our mouths. Mouths that can speak Torah, can dream Torah. 
So what are the texts? Maybe I'll break this up into two episodes and the first one, maybe just to get through a couple of them. But the first text that I love teaching and love talking about comes from Shemot 15, from the book of uh, Exodus. It is the scene that happens right after the splitting of the Red Sea, the Jewish people triumphantly walking through Miriam and her tambourine. When the Jewish people's first taste of freedom is bitterness and scarcity. Welcome to reality. So I'll read here in English and just to share why I feel like this is such a powerful psychedelic text. So then Moses caused Israel to set out from the Red Sea. They went on into the wilderness of Shur. They traveled three days in the wilderness and found no water. So imagining, maybe dreaming, as Dr. Ido Cohen says, you know, this dream of the Jewish people, the celebration, the freedom, the dignity, the joy, the expansiveness. We are met with another constriction, but a constriction on their terms. They came to Mara, but they could not drink the water of Mara because it was bitter. That is why it was named Mara, Mara meaning bitter. So they come to this brackish pool. Here is abundance, but not a drop to drink. And the people grumbled against Moshe, saying, What shall we drink? So he, Moshe, cried out to the divine, and the divine showed him a piece of wood. Now, this is very interesting getting into biblical Hebrew. It's not clear. I don't think it's clear. Uh, it's either that uh, that God shows Moshe this piece of wood, this plant, this tree, this shrub, or the same verb could indicate uh, not being shown, but actually being cast down. And so the difference between the revelation, the guiding toward, and just the intervention here, take this. I think it's a powerful image. I like to play with both of these when I'm thinking about the rest of the scene. So whether he was shown, it was revealed to Moshe, or that it was just cast down from heaven, a gift. He, Moshe, threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. So again, imagining this dream of the Jewish people, this is one of the first instances in the Hebrew Bible of plant medicine. There is a deep need, an ex existential need. If the Jewish people do not get water to drink, there is no going back to Egypt where they could just kick the channels of the Nile River and... Uh, new flowing water would come into their gardens. They are utterly dependent on every raindrop, every pool that they find. And this plant comes and saves them. The plant, the teacher, the prophet, even their cry, what shall we drink, is coming to help save them. But the rabbis pick up on this and comment that this is actually not just a miracle in itself, a piece of wood, a shrub being put into water and it turning sweet to drink. It's actually a double miracle. It's a miracle within a miracle. Because they teach that 
the wood itself, that plant, was bitter. And so the bitterness of the plant and the bitterness of the water, there is some alchemy when bitter meets bitter, and it recognizes the sweetness in both of them. And there's this transformation. Yes, this speaks to the lived experience of so many Jewish psychedelic explorers that we meet who are encountering the bitterness of their own lives. Not for the first time, but on their own terms. And the medicine that they work with, it sometimes intensifies that bitterness. There's no turning away, there's no hiding, there's, uh, there's no defense. But a confrontation or uh, an engaged awakening. And often, not all the time, it's that encounter with bitterness through this bitter medicine where there can be some resolution, there can be some understanding, there can be, as Dr. Rachel Yehuda described to me, you know, there can be a rewriting of the narrative where a person is no longer a victim, but becomes the subject of their own story, not the object in someone else's. And so then finally, just to finish this text, so there was a fixed rule that was made for them. So after this, uh, water turns sweet. There they, the divine voice comes in. If you will heed the eternal your God diligently, doing what is upright in my sight, giving ear to my commandments and keeping all my laws, then I will not bring any of the diseases that I brought upon the Egyptians. So this idea that we're in this relationship together, there's this framework that I want you to participate in. And what all of these things, commandments, laws, uh, doing what is right in my sight, there are heaps and heaps of commentary about this, but the way that this scene ends is Ani Adonai Rofecha. I am Hashem, your healer, your physician. Such a powerful statement, especially in the context of psychedelic healing, psychedelic medicine, psychedelic therapy, question about you know, where does the healing actually happen? What's the mechanism for healing trauma, grief, pain, even somatic pain? I'm seeing trials for lower back pain and mushrooms right now. There are so many theories that are out there. Um, we're working on it. They're working on it, rather. Um, so where does the healing come? And when we see also in the underground and even in therapy, you know, the question about who is doing the healing. Is it the therapist? Is it the shaman? Is it the medicine? Is it the person themselves? I think we're working with all of these different models. And many of them are you know, vying for supremacy. But I want to just offer this one from our sacred and indigenous texts. I am Hashem, your healer. That ultimately the healing uh, is, and I know that maybe this is uh, controversial now, <laughs> the healing is something that comes from uh, from outside us, but is, is catalyzed within us. That the, there is this process that where we ultimately are able to recognize healing from from beyond 
healing as this uh, this web of interconnection. For, I mean, just again, going back to the text, the crying out, the demand for water, the the teaching or the revelation or the the casting of of the plant in the water of that alchemy between them of the process this is this is the healing that uh, i experience and others do as well but to just maybe expanding the the window of of our understanding about where where healing comes from and the adonai lefecha Maybe I'll just bring one more just for today. There's so many. I'm finding these waves of of sadness, of feelings of brokenness and hopelessness. The political situation in Israel, the military situation, both in Israel and the Palestinian territories and the larger region. You know, my my meditation mostly is for being present with what I am responsible for and what I can ultimately affect. My zone of influence. But still just these somatic, emotional, spiritual ways, especially when seeing terrible news, terrible news about about innocent life being lost. And uh, through my own practice, but also uh, through something new that I'm learning, I'm in uh, Hakomi psychotherapy training uh, for the first time. It's really amazing work. Uh, But being present with all of the somatic, emotional, spiritual, soulful impulses that are within me, turning toward them, and ultimately using the breath as my anchor. Of course, in Jewish meditation circles for the past 40 years, maybe longer. This line from Psalms, the book of Psalms, Tehilim, Kol HaNeshama Tehal Aliyah. Let every breath praise the one. Um, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev, the Berdichev Rebbe, he speaks about this one line in a slightly different way, not only focusing on the breath. Um, he says in a short writing on Tisha B'Av, it is explained thus, because each person from Israel is obligated to believe with full faith that at every moment we receive life from the creator, blessed be. So just focusing on that. Every moment we receive life from the creator. This is a dynamic process. This is Shefa. This is why I named this organization Shefa when I started. We are receiving flow constantly. And he goes on, as it is explained in uh, the work of Breshit Rabbah, and also uh, specifically on Psalms, the, that verse from Psalms 150, verse 6. Everything that breathes praises, every single breath praises Yah, that in every moment, the living wants to leave a person. 
the Holy Blessed One is sending them new life force energy always. Wow. So adding this dimension, you know, oh, yes, breathing is constant. That's something that uh, is involuntary, and we tune into that. Beautiful teachings, beautiful grounding, beautiful practice. The Burdichiver adds kind of the shadow side here. That life actually wants to expire. Living wants to leave a person. It's kind of like, it's like entropy. However, the divine creator, the holy one, the presence is also counteracting that by constantly sending in new life force energy into that person at each moment. So there's this tension between life and death and what is keeping it together is this field of life force that is renewing itself constantly. Kol nishima tehalelia. That is why every breath is praising, because every breath that I am taking in is the conduit for that new life force. And yet, the expiration, it's escaping me. It wants to leave. It wants to go back to its creator. And it returns. So playing with the feeling of despair and healing, of bitter and sweet, of here and there, of dal, of downtrodden and yet still here po. This Elul, this last year, this last month, excuse me, of the Jewish year, my prayer for us is that we are working to hold at least two, if not more, dimensions of our existence. I think this is what we as Jews, as Jewish psychedelic explorers, we can add to the conversation in the larger psychedelic ecosystem, this and that. Dialogical thinking, majority and minority opinions, the near God far, the far God near, And in the merit of Hirsch, someone who explored so many worlds, such strong hopes for peace and reconciliation and justice, completely owned by his tradition and still incredibly free. My sacred wish for the end of this year is to come to clarify where we are, where we are, and how we can be more here. I'm wishing you an Elul of deep faith and trust in your own body, in your life, in your choices, and in our community and our ancestral ways to bring us back to right here. <laughs>